Hi, this is Ryan Zell of the Zell Challenge channel. We will now explore John Calvin's tyrannical, despotic, and capricious dieting. Calvin is the most important and most influential of all the Protestant reformers and theologians. Every Protestant denomination, sect, and cult have been infected in some manner by Calvin's theological heresies. This was largely due to Calvin writing for a much larger audience than the local population of his Protestant theocracy centered in the city of Geneva. Many second and third generation reformers worked with or were disciples of Calvin in Geneva. Unlike Luther, Calvin was a systematic theologian and provided a more coherent theology if one accepts the axioms foundational to his theology. Calvin, through his writings, provided the Protestant movement with a much needed theological foundation, which was very much lacking in the writings of the first generation Protestant reformers. Calvin was a lawyer by training. He had wished to pursue religious studies and even received a tonsure. However, his extremely overbearing father thought he would earn a better living as a lawyer. He had studied law at the University of Orleans and later at the University of Bourges. He received a licentiate in law which permitted him to provide instruction to Calvin first moved to Basel and then on to the Geneva, Switzerland. In Switzerland, he joined members of the Reformed movement within the larger Protestant movement, much as Martin Boozer and Heinrich Bullinger. Ehrlich Zwingli had been by this time killed during a blockade of food and supplies to Catholic cantons in northern Switzerland in an attempt to starve Catholics to death, which resulted in the Capital Wars. Protestants won an unimpeded access to preach in the Catholic cantons while suppressing and persecuting Catholics in the Swiss Protestant cantons. When Catholics prevented Protestants from reaching and preaching in Protestant cantons, some of the Protestant cantons led by Zurich chose to embargo food and supplies to the Catholic cantons. Boozer, Bollinger, and Zwingli were the first generation of Reformed Protestant church. Calvin was considered a second generation reformer. Calvin's Institute of the Re Christian Religion, which he continually revised and expanded throughout his lifetime, has had a profound influence on the larger Protestant movement. From its base in Switzerland, the Reform movement carried its Calvinistic theology to Scotland, England, the Low Countries, France, and Germany. In countries such as England, France, and the Netherlands, many became radicalized, such as the Puritans and Huguenots. He was the de facto theocratic ruler of the Geneva, who sentenced 58 persons to be deemed heretics and to be burned at the stake, including Martin Sabatis. This was more than the number of persons sentenced by Torquemada during his tenure as the Grand Inquisitor of the Spanish Inquisition. Worse was the fact that many of these persons were opponents of John Calvin's wealthy benefactors. Calvin was aware that the charges were trumped up, but nevertheless sentenced these persons to death. It was politically expedient burning a few innocent persons to death than run afoul of the wealthy merchants in Geneva. It must be noted that Calvin did not found a new denomination named Calvinism. Rather, Calvin was a part of an already existing reform movement. Calvin's theological writings influenced the movement and provided the movement with a systematic theology. The reform movement takes on different names depending on the country in which it existed. Congregationalists in England, Huguenots in France, Presbyterians in Scotland, Puritans in England, and Reformed churches in Switzerland, the Low Countries, and Germany. Calvinist theology has influenced almost every other Protestant denomination in some manner. John Calvin begins with two premises which form the first principles of Calvin's Reformed theology. First and foremost is the sovereignty of God. God is absolutely sovereign over all his creation. He determines election and retrobation and does so to demonstrate his own glory. Second is Calvin's own idea of what original sin is. To Calvin, original sin rendered humanity insurmountably, totally and utterly depraved and incapable of participating in redemption. Calvin always seeks to affirm, defend, and preserve God's sovereignty over his creation at all costs. The sovereignty of God is the most fundamental axiom of the Calvinist theological system. 
Calvin's deity is absolutely sovereign over all of creation. It is above all the greatest attribute of God. God is the absolute arbiter and governor of all things who of his own wisdom from the remotest eternity decreed what he would do and now by his own power executes what he has decreed. Calvin asserts that he dictates not only the heaven and the earth and inanimate creatures, but also the deliberations and volations of men who so govern by their providence that they are directed exactly to their destined end. There is nothing left to chance in the universe as God exercises meticulous control over every aspect of creation and what happens within it. Should man be accorded a will which is free to choose, this would detract from the glory of the divine and his sovereignty. The will of God is the supreme and first cause of all things because nothing happens but by his command or permission. Hence, the Calvinistic deity determinately orders the universe and everything in it in the minutest component, including the voluntary choices which are made by men. This which Calvin posits as the divine greatest attribute, which is his fee and absolute sovereignty, which Calvinism seeks to protect above all, this free and absolute sovereignty of God is maintained in his discrimination that exists among men in respect of election, on the one hand, and retribution on the other. In the matter of election, he insists that the salvation of believers depends on the eternal election of God, for which no cause or reason can be rendered, but his own gratuitous good pleasure. The sovereignty of God is a demonstration of his glory to those whom he arbitrarily elects. The original sin is that of Adam and Eve eating of the tree of knowledge of good and evil in direct contravention to the divine command of not eating of the fruit of that tree. In doing so, Adam and Eve contravene and commit the proto-sin into which all human beings inherit. In Calvinism, this original sin renders man's nature totally and utterly depraved and corrupt, and this depravity and corruption is diffused into all parts of the soul. Human nature is not merely bereft of good, but is so productive of every kind of evil that it cannot be inactive. Man, from intellect to will, from the soul to the flesh, is all defiled and crammed with depravity. Or, to sum it up briefly, that the whole man is in himself nothing but depravity. Original sin is actual and hereditary, meaning that every human being carries this sin and is born into this sin. Original sin is not merely a condition or a state man finds himself in, but an actual sin that is inherited from the parent. Original sin causes man to be naturally evil, and this sin causes a corruption of human nature totally and utterly. Since man is totally and utterly corrupt, he lacks any ability to give assent to grace and is unable to cooperate with grace if it were offered to him. All Calvinist doctrines flow from these governing theological principles of John Calvin, the overarching principle being the sovereignty of God over his universe and his notion of original sin. If one accepts these two theological principles, the rest of Calvin's theology will logically follow suit. The Synod of Dort was convoked in 1618 by the Dutch Reformed Church, which brought in Reformed Protestants from all throughout Europe to deal with the Arminianism movement within the Reform movement. The resulting canons of Dort affirmed five heads of Reform doctrine. These were divine predestination, death of Christ and the redemption of man, corruption of man, conversion to God in its manner, perseverance of the saints. In the 20th century, these five points were given the acrostic tulip by American Protestants. Total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, perseverance of the saint. This is a summary of the five points of Calvinism, which Reformed theologians sought to affirm as a part of Reformed theology. Total depravity. Man is totally dead in sin and totally and utterly depraved, incapable of goodness due to the fall. There is nothing man can do to overcome this completely and utter depravity of the human nature following the fall, which affects every part of man's nature. 
Every man is conceived in this hereditary sin and born in this sin. Man, left to his own devices, can neither seek the good nor is capable of goodness due to the original sin. Every person born into the world is enslaved to the service of sin as a result of their fallen nature, and apart from the saving grace of God, is utterly unable to choose to follow God, refrain from evil, or accept the gift of a salvation as it is often. Man by his nature is evil. As a result of the fall, not inclined or even able to love God wholly or with heart, mind, and strength, but rather are inclined by nature to serve their own will and desires and reject God's rule. Even if man appears to have performed any seeming good, it is performed by unconditional election. Man has no choice in his election and is unable to affect his election in any manner due to the complete depravity of his nature. Since man is unable to affect his own election in any manner, the divine must elect certain persons to be saved. The divine before all ages predetermined some persons to salvation and others to be damned for all eternity for their sins. Thus God chooses whom he elects to eternal life in heaven and whom he damns to hell. It is his decision alone and is immutable as nothing can be done to affect a change in his predetermined result. The choice made by the divine is not based on any factors. Elect does not depend on anything inherent in any person chosen, on any act that a person performs, or on any belief that a person exercises, nor if given a choice would choose the good as man cannot choose except what is evil due to his nature. Since the influence of sin has so inhabited the individual's volition that no one is willing to or able to come to or to follow God apart from God first, regenerating the person's soul, give them the ability to love him and take part in the salvation process. Hence, God's choice in election is can only be based solely on God's own independent and sovereign will and not determined upon the divinely foreseen actions of the individual. The election is purely a choice God makes for the purpose of his own glory's sake. It is his decision alone, and nothing can be done to change it. Such election is based on the arbitrary will of God and not based on anything the individual can do. God does not base his choice on who will choose him, but rather his arbitrary will. To those whom he elects, he will give the grace of faith. Limited Atonement Though Christ's atonement for the sins of mankind was sufficient for all of humanity in the past, present, and the future, it was the intention of the Father that the atonement of Christ's death would work itself out in the elect only, thereby leading them in without fail to salvation. In Calvin's doctrine of the limited atonement, Christ died for the sins of the elect alone, and no atonement was provided for the retrobate. The doctrine of the limited atonement is derived from Calvin's understanding of the atonement of Christ and the fall of mankind due to original sin and his view of predestination. Calvin's advocate, a view of the atonement known as penal substitutionary atonement, which states that the atonement of Christ pays the penalty incurred by the sins of man, that is, Christ receives the wrath of God for sins, thereby receives in himself the penalty of the sins of men. The Father exacts vengeance upon Christ, who becomes sin itself, and merits therefore the wrath of the Father. Christ did not die on the cross for the sins of all mankind, but solely for the sins of those whom the Father chose to elect to salvation. The unelect do not gain any benefit from Christ's atonement. There is no propitiation for their sins. Since Christ did not die for the unelect, and their sins are not washed away, they will be damned for all eternity. Irresistible Grace Through the operation of the Holy Spirit, God provides grace to all mankind. Grace is in this manner a divine power which God exercises in his own interest and has predetermined before all creation as to how and who would be provided such graces. The divine exercises this divine power in a manner consistent with his own goals and his sovereignty over all creation. Grace is irresistible. No one can be given grace, can resist grace, which means that grace is not only efficacious, it also accomplishes its intent. Man is unable to refuse 
participation in such graces in the same manner that creation cannot resist the creative will of the divine. Creation cannot resist the creative power of the creator. Through grace, the divine determines every good accomplished by man. Without the action of grace, man's total and utter depravity will always cause man to be evil and seek evil by his own nature and grace works. Grace works in opposition to human nature to prevent man from complete self-destruction. Calvin posits that there are two forms of graces which the divine makes available to mankind, serving grace and common grace. Calvin posits that there are two forms of graces which the divine makes available to mankind, saving grace and common grace. Saving grace is given to those who are the elect. Common grace is given to all persons regardless of their predetermined state of election. Perseverance of the saints. Perseverance of the saints, also referred to as eternal security or once saved, always saved, asserts that once persons are truly born of God or regenerated by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and therefore members of the elect, nothing in heaven or, or on earth shall be able to separate them from the love of God resulting in eternal security. Calvinist theology maintains that God elected certain individuals before the world began and thus draws them to faith in his Son, Jesus Christ. When Jesus said, No man can come unto me except the Father which hath sent me draw him, Jesus was saying that men had to be drawn to him by God before they would believe, and that he only draws those to whom he had chosen. Calvinists have long taught that when the Apostle Paul wrote, God hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, he was indicating that God actually chose believers in Christ before the world was founded, not based on foreseen faith, but based upon his sovereign decision to save whomever he pleased to save. According to Calvinism, God begins a good work in only those he chooses and then continues it. Those who the Father has elected, the Son has redeemed, and the Spirit has saved. The Calvinist tradition has consistently seen the doctrine of perseverance as a natural consequence to predestination. According to Calvinists, since God has drawn the elect to faith in Christ by regenerating their hearts and convincing them of their sins, and thus saving their souls by his own work and power, it naturally follows that they will be kept by the same power to the end. Since God has made satisfaction for the sins of the elect, they can no longer be condemned for them, and through the help of the Holy Spirit they must necessarily persevere as Christians and in the end be saved. Calvinists believe this is what Peter was teaching in 1 Peter 1 verse 5 when he says that true believers are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. Calvinists also believe that all who are born again and justified before God necessarily and inexorably proceed to sanctification. Failure to proceed to sanctification in their view is considered by some as evidence that the person in cast question was never truly saved to begin with. Calvinists distinguish between an action and the consequences of an action and suggest that after God has regenerated someone, the person's will has been changed, that old things pass away and all things are become new, as it is written in the Bible, and he or she will, as a consequence, persevere in faith. Thus, all who are truly born again are kept by God the Father for Jesus Christ and can neither totally nor finally fall into the state of grace, but will persevere in their faith to the end and be eternally saved. While Reformed theologians acknowledge that true believers at times will fall into sin, they maintain that a real believer in Jesus Christ cannot abandon one's own personal faith to the dominion of sin. Those who are not counted among the elect and therefore no given saving grace are damned to hell for all eternity. Calvin proposed two concepts of grace, that of saving grace and common grace. One must keep in mind that each type of grace is effective in accomplishing what it ordains. Saving graces. 
God foreordained before the creation of the world those who are predestined to be elect, those that will be going to heaven, and those who are damned, those that will be going to hell, to those whom he elected. He provides the gift of faith through saving graces, which is irresistible at an appointed time acceptable to him. No one can do anything to merit saving grace and is entirely the sovereign will of God, which determines who receives this saving grace. God provides these saving graces as an unmerited gift at his own good pleasure to fulfill his own immutable purposes without any prior preconditions required for this saving grace. The elect who receive these saving graces will determine them towards the good and therefore to heaven. All the rest of humanity are eternally damned. Common graces. Calvinists claim that God loves all his creation and is good to all that he has created without regard to the status of their election. This love and compassion for all is manifest by the common graces he provides to all mankind. Common grace is a restraint which God uses to count the human being's total depravity, to directly intervene and restrain individuals from committing sin or other destructive or antisocial behavior. Common graces act as a restraint against the destructive power of sin to maintain a moral order within families, society, and nations. The unelected, that is, unsaved persons, predestined to be damned through this common grace, are determined toward good works which are meritless. Though common graces keep society ordered and functional, common graces does not provide for election. Common grace does not improve man's unregenerate nature, nor does it improve his ability to change his moral standing before God. It has no function in the plan of salvation. God's call to humanity, general election, and the effectual call. The general call. God commands that his gospel of belief and repentance be preached to all mankind and requests that the apostles spread the gospel to all nations. God calls all men to come to him through this general call to all mankind to repent, believe in Christ and the gospel, and be saved. All those who so do wish may come to God. However, only the elect receive the effectual call by God to salvation. The elect, through the deterministic workings of saving grace, are determined to the good and do so freely. God does not make this call to godliness in good faith since it is impossible for unregenerated, totally depraved man to truly obey such a command without the saving grace of God. Those who come heeding the general call but are not predestined to receive saving grace, God's call to them to a death and greater condemnation for his own greater glory. There is no intention on the part of God that the unelect should respond to this general call, but he issues this call out of his manifest love for his creation and mankind. The effectual call. God has predetermined before the creation of the universe as to whom he would elect. Those whom he has predestined to salvation, he will effectively call, and he reaches out to save them through the effectual call. He calls them out of darkness. He calls them out of unbelief. He calls them out of confusion and chaos. He calls them out of sin and unholiness. This is God's sovereign saving call. And he unyieldingly, in exercising his power to make the elect sinner come into his court, come in and be presented as forgiven and justified on the way to eternal glory. Unlike the general call, which has no potential except being greater condemnation upon the unelect, the effective call has a potentiality and an efficacy. The effectual call is mediated through saving grace. Those whom he effectively calls, he will also justify. Those whom he justifies, he will also glorify. It is only those persons who receive the effective you will call, who receive the faith and saving faith. The Calvinist Dichotomy synthesizing the thesis and antithesis into a deity of Calvin's making. Predestination. Predestination is the concept that the divine has preordained in some manner the activities of man, including man's final end. Calvinism, seeking to protect the absolute sovereignty of the divine within the universe, proposes that the divine determines every situation, action, and outcome within creation. 
absolutely nothing in the universe is left to accident or chance within Calvin's theology. Every action of every individual human being is predestined by God, and nothing that man can do can change the predetermined fate of the individual. Central to Calvinism is the absolute sovereignty of the divine. Calvinism presupposes that without the ability to predetermine action and outcome, God cannot be absolutely sovereign. Calvinism posits that the divine has only predetermined before the beginning of time as to who would be counted among the elect, but would be damned for all eternity. This is commonly referred to as double predestination, where the divine not only predetermines who is to enter into glory, but also those who are to be damned. Freedom. In the deterministic worldview, how does human freedom exist? Man without saving grace will always exist in the state of total depravity. This is the default position of the human state. Man will choose evil by default. Man will freely choose to do evil. Man who has been chosen to receive saving grace and therefore among the elect will freely choose to do good. When saving grace is provided, God changes the way the person thinks by illuminating their minds and replaces their heart of stone with a heart of flesh. The person will is renewed and strengthened. Thus the elected person is determined to that which is good and the elect individual freely chooses the good over evil. The individual could have freely chosen evil but chose good but freely chooses the good over what of that which is evil because the person desires the good due to the internal illumination of the individual by saving grace. Since the individual chooses what he desires freely, human freedom is preserved. This is known as compatibilism. Individual freedom is preserved while preserving divine sovereignty. The resulting deity, the Calvinistic deity, is an egomanical being whose only concern is to gobsmack poor mortals by demonstrating his potentiality and sovereign omnipotence by condemning and rewarding mortals based on his mere whim, so that those whom he elects might be everlastingly beholden for his mercy towards them. The Catholic response? Catholics disagree with all the Calvinist particulars. Total depravity? The Catholic Church magisterially teaches that man was created good for the good. Disobedience by the first parents caused man to lose sanctifying grace and take on a concupiscent nature. Catholics understand that original sin has two meanings within Catholic theology. Firstly, there is a proto-sin which Adam and Eve committed, which is in their own nature alone and is not inherited by human beings. Secondly, there is the state of the human condition subsequent to the fall where man inherits a concupiscent nature devoid of sanctifying grace due to the fall, which is a state of being into which all human beings are born. Original sin, as pertains to human beings today, is not actual sin, but a state of being, which causes the loss of sanctifying grace. Concupiscent nature and a clouded intellect. The loss of sanctifying grace causes us separation from the Almighty. The concupiscent nature disorders the appetites of lower human faculties. The clouding of the intellect impacts the human being to reason rightly. In Judaism, this is known as the Yazara. Man is not totally depraved, but exists in a disordered state due to the fall. Human beings, for this reason, are capable of great good, as can be evidenced by many atheists, agnostics, pagans, and non-Christians. Man is still able to use his reason to choose between good and evil. As man is not totally depraved, and as the Catholic Church teaches, man can freely participate in his own redemption by cooperating with graces provided to him. Unconditional election? Since man is not totally depraved, and therefore can, by the exercise of his free will, choose between good and evil, and choose to cooperate or reject those graces made available by the divine, it is up to the individual to choose between what is good or evil by the exercise of his will. 
While the Almighty knows how man will choose, he does not determine the outcome, as he permits man to make a free choice. The Almighty respects human freedom and permits us to choose freely, but constantly calls us towards him and his church. It is through this freedom of association with the divine that one comes to the Almighty. The Almighty does not force the human will into compliance. God loves man and demonstrates his love for his mere creature by dying on the cross for man. God actively wills that all men be redeemed. However, his will permits man to reject his offer of redemption, choose evil over the good, and reject the graces he provides. The Catholic Church is the church of the elect. All those who are of the elect are visible or at least spiritually members of the Catholic Church. The Almighty has ordained that all those who are of the elect belong to this body of believers, which is his church. The church transcends space and time and exists in heaven, in purgatory, and on earth. Limited atonement. The Catholic Church teaches that Christ bore the universal penalty for sin by dying on the cross for all mankind, regardless if they are a virtuous or a retrobate. Not only did Christ atone for the sins of the elect in his church, but those outside the Catholic Church. The meritorious act of Christ's sacrifice is sufficient for the redemption of all humanity, past, present, and future, and therefore is unlimited. The Catholic conception of the atonement is that Christ offered himself up in self-sacrificial love to the Father, obedient even unto death for the sins of all men. In his human will, he offered to God sacrifice of love that was more pleasing to the Father than the combined sins of all men of all time are displeasing to him, and thus made satisfaction for our sins. Christ's passion and death are infinitely meritorious in the eyes of the Father. Thus, forgiveness for the universal sins of man are made available through the passion and death of Christ upon the cross. For God so loved the world as to give his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him may not perish, but may have life everlasting. For God sent not his Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world may be saved by him. Irresistible Grace the Catholic Church teaches that God wills that all be saved and provides man sufficient actual grace to each individual for his or her salvation. This is not dependent on whether or not the person is counted among the elect and therefore members of the Catholic Church. The object of these graces bestowed upon mankind who are not members of his church has the ultimate goal to draw the individual closer to the divine and into his church. While the Almighty offers the gift of grace to all men, man is required to give assent to the graces offered by cooperating with these graces each step of the way. As one cooperates with the graces offered, more graces are made available. Actual, previent grace is offered to man to enable belief and come into his church. Should one accept and be baptized, sanctifying grace, lost at the fall, is restored to the individual. The sanctifying grace begins the process of sanctification. Grace is not irresistible, but requires human cooperation every step of the way. Man can choose to accept or reject grace by the exercise of his free will. Perseverance of the saints. Baptism restores the sanctifying grace is lost due to being born in the state of original sin. Being in a state of sanctifying grace makes the individual pleasing to the Almighty and thereby is justified before God. Sanctifying grace begins the process of the ongoing sanctification of the individual with his cooperative effort. As long as the individual maintains his state of sanctifying grace, the process of sanctification continues. The state of the sanctifying grace is lost when the individual commits a mortal sin. These are the sins which the Apostle John calls as a sin unto death. An individual who is in a state of mortal sin is no longer justified and the process of sanctification ends. Confessing one's sin and the sacrament of extreme unction restores sanctifying grace and restarts the process of sanctification in the individual. The Catholic Church teaches that those who have been justified can lose their justification due to mortal sin. The Catholic Verdict on TULIP 
Each of the five points of Protestantism is considered a heresy by the Catholic Church. Catholicism rejects all five points of Calvin's theology as they are incompatible with Catholicism. As St. Thomas Aquinas states in the Summa Theologica, to love is to will the good of the other. Now to all our neighbors we wish an equal good, certainly everlasting life. To love someone is to wish the good of the other and the greatest good is heaven and the everlasting life. The divine wishes that all persons come to salvation and provides enough graces to enter into his church and therefore be counted among the elect. If God truly loved human beings, he must will that all human beings come to salvation or else he cannot truly love mankind. As Aristotle states, let loving then be defined as wishing for anyone the things which we believe to be good. For his sake, but not for our own, and procuring them for him as far as lies in our power. Even the pagan philosophers understood this. If what Calvinism states is true, then mankind has a far higher and nobler understanding of love than the divine is capable of greater love than God himself. The Relationship of the Divine Trinity Before all time, the Trinity existed where each person existed in a relationship of abiding love with the other. The nature of the Trinity is to be the lover, the father, to be loved, the son, and to be the preceding love itself, the Holy Spirit. The distinction between the persons exists in relational distinction of love to each other. Now we have some questions for Calvinists. Question one, given that God is sovereign over all of creation and the determined person to their final end, why should anyone become a Christian given that anyone who is going to be saved is going to be saved and who is damned is going to be damned and nothing we can do makes a difference? Question two, given that at Calvin's God has predetermined the final end of every individual, why should any person on this earth choose to do the good over that which is evil, as neither the good nor the evil one does not determine one's reward or punishment in the afterlife? Question 3. Given that Calvin's God punishes those who heed the general call, but not among the elect more severely than those who do not heed the general call, why should anyone become a Christian as they will endure greater punishment in the afterlife. Question four, given that Calvin's God has predetermined the final end of all and punished those unelected who heed the general call more severely than those who ignore it, why should any Christian prolesticize non-Christians? The fifth and final question, since the Calvinist deity determines the destiny of each human soul, how is it just that those who commit evil are punished as that deity is the cause of all that is evil, having been the cause of that which is evil. Please consider subscribing to this channel and join the discussion by commenting. God bless you all.